Michiganders can be a superstitious bunch. We find all sorts of reasons to explain the world around us, sometimes pulling from science, sometimes tradition, and sometimes from our imaginations. What happens when we can't readily explain our experiences, and what happens when a ghost story gets out of hand? Do these legends stem entirely from fantasy, or are people seeing things no one can truly explain? I'm Krista K. Coburn. And I'm Kay Gray. Welcome to Haunted Mitten. There are 93 colleges and universities in Michigan. The oldest is the University of Michigan, founded in 1817 in Detroit as the University of Michigania, 20 years before we became a state. Several of these institutions of higher learning have roots in the 19th century. Is it any wonder that some of them might be haunted? In this episode, we are going to focus on two universities. The first is Central Michigan University, or CMU, which my father actually attended for his undergrad. Reading from Wikipedia... CMU is a public research university located in Mount Pleasant in the U.S. state of Michigan. Established in 1892, Central Michigan University is one of the largest universities in the state of Michigan and one of the nation's largest, one of the nation's 100 largest public universities. It has more than 20,000 students on its Mount Pleasant campus and 7,000 students enrolled online at more than 60 locations worldwide. I think that's bigger than most all the colleges I've ever been to. Wow. I've been to some small places. One of them was a community college. I don't know if that counts. Nah, they're always small. Yeah. That's big. That's big. It's, to me, it's big. The, to the Californians, somehow, it's big. There are two major hauntings reported, and they both actually have names attached to them. We were able to find both women's death certificates, and in one case, an article about her death in the campus newspaper from June 2nd, 1937, right after it happened. Her name was Teresa Elizabeth Schumacher, and she was named as the ghost of Warner Hall. She died on May 29, 1937, at 10.30 a.m., when, according to the Central State Life article, her head was trapped within a small window in the door leading to the elevator shaft. A bar near the top of the elevator caught her when the automatically operated cage was started in some undetermined fashion. Death came from strangulation, according to the coroner. No one witnessed the actual accident, but fellow employees in the cafeteria became alarmed when the girl did not answer when spoken to. We'll link to the newspaper article on our site so you can read the whole account, but wow, that is a hell of a way to go. Many retellings of this tragic accident report that she was decapitated, but this article does not say anything of the sort. Michigan's other side tells a nearly identical story about an actress in Warner Hall, but I suspect that this is a false story that got mixed up with Teresa's very real death. Teresa was a food service worker on campus, and she died when she was only 19. So this is a pretty sad story. Warner Hall is now the administration building, but it has served many purposes in its history, and there was once a women's commons and cafeteria on the third floor of the West Wing. I don't know how old elevators work, but it seems weird that there would be a little hole that you can fit a head in during the elevator's operation. <laughs> yeah, some of the, the retellings do report that it was a dumbwaiter. But I don't know. People report seeing lights flashing on and off, hearing footsteps and loud knocking, and feeling cold near the elevator. According to the book Creepy Colleges and Haunted Universities by Cynthia Fuma and Catherine Lower, in 1969, students saw Teresa on the fifth floor of the tower. She's been seen occasionally ever since. Haunted Colleges and Universities, Creepy Campuses, Scary Scholars, and Deadly Dorms by Tom Ogden reports sightings of a blue lady. In 1982, a student saw a transparent woman on the stage of the auditorium. A professor told them it was just the resident ghost. The Michigan Paranormal Research Society investigated in 1993. The crew experienced technical failures and feeling a presence. While near the elevator shaft to the location of the elevator ghost, they felt cold air and one of the women jerked back, having felt a cold gust of air pass through her. When in the clock tower, one investigator also saw a man's face. This so-called elevator ghost has supposedly been seen in the rafters, appearing as mist and touching actors. White blue lady, huh? Yeah, yeah, blue ladies now. <laughs> 
Um, well, I was listening to the one of my favorite podcasts, The History of the English Language, and he talked about um, in ancient times, or not ancient times, but like certainly quite a while ago in English history, uh, European history, blue was the color of purity, and that's what women wore on their wedding day, mm. and rather than white, which is uh, stems from Victorian times. Yeah. Um, and that's where you get the, they think, the adage, you know, something borrowed, something blue Yeah. on your wedding day. Um, so it's interesting that you get these white and blue ladies. That makes sense because um, white ladies are seen at, like, they are seen in white because that is supposed to symbolize their innocence and their purity. They either died young or they are um, looking for their child, their husband their lover or something like that something that's not very um sinful unlike red ladies which are a thing yes <laughs> which we'll and, get to later and that are the opposite of a white lady weird um but i was thinking about why white and blue uh and i didn't know that blue fact until now which is great yeah i was just listening to that this morning yeah um which helps a lot because i always wondered why those two colors together um and the virgin mary is often uh, her color is blue she is shown in a blue veil yeah that makes sense and i was trying to think of like a physical reason for that not that i'm necessarily sure that you can put science to the paranormal but i'm sure as heck going to try maybe white and blue is easier to manifest for a ghost i have no idea most of the ghosts that we talk of, that we think of when we think of ghosts, we think like a white sheet. Um, the shroud. Yeah. yeah. Which is Victorian. That stems from Victorian times. Yeah. Thanks, Victorians. <laughs> you gave us everything. Thanks. They gave us a lot. Yeah. They did. <laughs> Especially in the paranormal world. <laughs> thanks, spiritualism. And it, I think it's weird that we don't see ghosts in really any other color. We never see like a purple ghost or like a yellow ghost. It's We see white ghost or a blue one or occasionally a red one if that person was super duper sinful in life yeah sexy ladies <laughs> uh, there's the brown lady yeah there is the brown lady of Greenbrier. i think is mm -hmm. where she is she was seen in a brown brocade dress and, and sometimes they're said to fade over time there was the it's an article or a book and i cannot remember where i will try i really will try to find where i read that um that says there was, I believe it was the early 19th century, someone reported this, seeing a spirit, um, and was reported as being, like, dark brown, I think, but dark, distinct. And then, near, I believe it's the end of the same century, another very different person, several decades later, reported seeing the exact same thing, so it's uh, residual, but it was faded. It was, uh, it was now gray, instead of being brown. I think it was brown. But it was much lighter. And um, since then, no one has reported ever seeing it. Oh, wow. Um, there's a theory that certain kinds of rock hold certain memories. Um, and that's one of the reasons for things like residual ghosts, which is when a ghost can't really answer you. It's just doing its thing, going through the motions of whatever it was doing it whenever that poor person was doing before they died, their routine, it is just continuing on that routine. That's kind of what a residual is. It doesn't have the mental capacity, question mark, to talk to you. Um, yeah, it's not actually a spirit. It's not actually a conscious person. It's, yeah. It's, it's, more it's like, a recording. Yeah. It's more like a memory, um, a recording. So it does. So there are theories that say that certain types of stone can hold those recordings. So it's interesting that they would fade away because rocks would too erosion is a thing right and like like old mag magnetic tapes cassette tapes yeah vhs those eventually do disintegrate and yeah fade literally fade away um so that that does make sense yeah that, that could be a thing totally um so maybe that white lady didn't start off that color <laughs> maybe she didn't yeah <laughs> maybe she started blue and faded to white who knows and maybe they just appear white because they're very pale and that's how our brains interpret them or pale blue yeah, that's true. Because it's, yeah, it's not like it's a royal blue or something. It's Right, it's always pale. Yeah. And it could just be people interpreting it as one color or the other. Also true. It could 
generally be the same color, but our eyes see different mm-hmm. color differently. That reminds me of another fun story. Go on. <laughs> I have so many fun stories. Um, I was reading about the history of color, and uh, there was a guy who was experimenting with how we experience color, and he raised his child without the color blue, without the concept of the color blue. And when he asked her what color is the sky, she said white. I'm like stunned in silence because I definitely know this is a thing. We've studied this in sociology before. Color is a color is a social construct. It is, yes. Um, obviously not the physical nature of color. Color is a thing, but how we perceive color is definitely dependent on the community in which we grow up. Yes, yes, it is. That's still nuts. <laughs> I ran into that when I was in Japan. Their their concept of blue and green is different from ours. Yeah. But, yeah, that just made me think, oh, right, there was that child in that experiment. Yeah. All right, that poor child that had to be subjected to that. Thanks, science parents. Yeah. (laughs) Scientist (laughs) parents are interesting people. So it could be people just interpreting um, blue and, and, well, pale blue and white as the same thing. That's a good point. Yeah. I do see blue and purple differently than everyone else in the world. (laughs) So I understand how so, yeah, you can it, confuse one for the other. It could be. They're not electric blue. They are pale blue. Yeah. That makes sense. So unfortunately, this next location was demolished in 1997, which hurts my heart because I love old architecture so much. I was going to say it wasn't destroyed that long ago. We could have gone. Then I realized how long ago 1997 really was. And now I feel old. Yep. There is a new building on the same site. Uh, it serves the College of Medicine, but we don't know if the activity continues. There's speculation that it does, but no one has actually said. But it is a pretty famous story and enduring on campus, which is why we are including it. This ghost's name is supposedly Carolyn Corey, a student who died in her sleep on May 6, 1951, in her dorm room in Barnard Hall, which is the former hall. It is not the current hall. The 1986 Chippewa, which is their yearbook, included an article on this haunting and named Carolyn as the ghost. It claimed that practical jokes were her specialty, and she liked to, quote-unquote, party in the attic and open the attic windows. This sounds like it was a mostly auditory experience rather than people seeing or feeling things. She sounds like a really annoying ghost, because I know I hate it when the neighbors upstairs party too loud and too late into the night. Yeah. I would hate it even more if there wasn't someone to go yell at. Yeah. Yeah. And this seems like a common thing with dorms, this um, being in the attic, opening the top floor windows, things like that. Yeah. I ran into that a lot with campus stories. Oh, okay. So it's a thing that crosses campuses. Yeah. Like a common legend. The Michigan Paranormal Research Society visited before the building was torn down when it was closed due to poor enrollment. They used a Ouija board or spirit board if you're old school in the room that Carolyn had supposedly died in and wrote down every response to their questions. They later asked a staff member the same questions and compared answers. They were, apparently, identical. I was also able to confirm Carolyn's death, but was she the one haunting the hall? We can't really say for sure again. Uh, I always get excited when I can confirm events in people, but we have to remember that these were real people with real families and loved ones. Teresa left behind not only her parents, but 10 siblings. So all I'm asking is for people to please be mindful when claiming real people as ghosts, especially when apparitions haven't been clearly seen, as in, it seems the case of Carolyn. Yeah, I feel more confident in saying that um, Teresa is the elevator ghost, just because the story matches the apparition scene. It does. Um, It does seem to. Except for the, apparently a man's face was seen in the tower. We, I don't know what that's about i don't know what that's about either and that's the only instance we have of it so who knows um but because we don't know anything about carolyn and because she's it's never been her apparition that's been seen who knows right and i couldn't find anything about was she a partier when she was alive was she a practical joker i couldn't find anything about that could you find anything of the haunting before her death no, there's no mention of that either. Then I don't know. Yeah. I just don't know. And the hall with Teresa was fairly new when she died. There was another hall on that site. It, I believe it burned down. And then it, the current one was built in the 20s. And then she died in the 30s. Mm-hmm. So it was fairly new when she died. So 
yeah, something could have been going on before she died, but there's no record of that. And it, it, again, it was a fairly new building. So Right. Um, anything else happening at CMU? There are some quick little fun individual dorm stories because every dorm is haunted. They have their resident ghosts. <laughs> it's Hogwarts. <laughs> it is. It's your house ghosts. Um, there's the Myron A. Cobb Residence Hall. I'm reading from uh, Haunted Colleges and Universities Retold by Tom Ogden. He does seem to paraphrase a lot of other people. <laughs> it's really retold. It's not his book. Yes, truly. Um, so the Myron A. Cobb Residence Hall opened in 1970 as a women's dormitory, but became co-ed three years later. In 2009, a first-year female student in room 406 woke to see an apparition leaning over her laundry basket. Moments later, the specter was sitting in a nearby chair. Strange things still happen. The room's doorknob rattles and the bathroom sink seems to whistle, in quotes. The shower also turns itself on and off. This this doorknob rattling thing is really common in dorms, too. Yeah. That pops up a lot. Yeah. Charles. I have a feeling that's mostly just yeah. jerk other students. I don't know. Or having lived in a dorm. It's loose and there's vibrations. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That could be know. any number of things. I will say yeah. that yeah. student dorms are not the best kept up buildings. Not generally, no. <laughs> At least none of mine have been. And all the ones I was in at Western were relatively new. Mm-hmm. 50s, 60s, 70s. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, they still were not the best kept up dorms. There's the Charles C. Barnes Hall. Opened in 1939. Allegedly, at some point, a female student hanged herself in the study after her boyfriend broke up with her. She now haunts the building, especially the second floor. Her favorite tricks seem to be moving around personal objects and causing interference on TVs. Students placate her by placing tchotchkes that they think will amuse her around the room, which I think is kind of cute. That's pretty cute. Not sure if that one's real. I don't know. It's, It's a fun little story for kids that live there. The R.D. Calkins Hall has had um, prank phone calls. Okay. Um, once the police received a distress call from someone in a room on the first floor, but when they investigated, they discovered that no one was living there. May K. Walt Hall. A young lady living there came out of a shower to see the words, help me, written in the steamed up mirror. Frightened by the message, the students soon quit the university. Aw, come on. <laughs> the Phantom is thought to be a female student who committed suicide in her dorm room. Because that's what they all think. There are so many dorm, dorm stories where it's a student committed. So usually a woman. It's almost exclusively women, which is interesting. Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, commit, supposedly committed suicide in her room and now haunts the hall. A lot of these are like that. Oh. Um, a staff member at Carlin Alumni House once entered the empty building to hear the disembodied voices of a man and woman chatting. The moment the security switch was disarmed, the noises stopped as if the ghosts quit talking as soon as they realized they could be heard. So that's kind of fun. Um, a male specter's laugh has also been heard, and a white cloud has been seen floating around the rear of the building. And this is a ridiculous one. I'm going to read. I, I totally don't believe this one. <laughs> I, totally don't believe I like this one, though. In the 1930s, a junior music student named Emily died in Powers Hall while practicing piano. Reportedly, she was buried at her parents' request under an array of hedges forming the shape of a piano in the building's foyer, what's sometimes called the piano garden. Today, the sound of Emily's ethereal playing occasionally emanates from that area of the lobby, although some versions of the tale say the music actually comes from the practice room where the young woman died, even when it's empty. I don't buy it. No. (laughs) Um, No university is going to let someone bury someone on campus. I just think that's so strange. Why would she? Why would her parents think she would want to be buried there? Oh, I wouldn't. Yeah. I just. College? No. College was terrible. <laughs> I didn't. I did not even look into that one because I thought it was kind of ridiculous. No. If anyone else has more yeah. information, please correct me. But that would be great. Like maybe there's a memorial there or something. Again, we haven't right. been to CMU. It's rather far from here. Right. I I went there as a child, but I I certainly wasn't looking for ghosts. Right. And I don't remember it very well. So. Mm-hmm. Um, the field house has weird noises. It says, in the 1930s, one of the school's football players died during practice at Alumni Field. Uh, It's located between the Health Professions Building and Finch Fieldhouse. Today, people standing on the grassy expanse feel distinct cold spots, which are thought to signify the presence of his ghost. That one I totally believe. I'm actually looking up the death records at Central Michigan University. (laughs) Um, I hate to say that something happened in 2018. That's actually very sad. It wasn't a suicide, but um, a college student 
unfortunately fell down the stairs and didn't make it. While we're kind of making light of some of these things because they did happen long ago, let's remember that tragedies do happen. Yeah, there there are definitely some tragedies. There, um, there's a cute story associated with their seal. Every university there, or school that has a seal, there's something about it. You're not supposed to cross it because you'll fail. Or oh, yeah. Something like that. Ours, I think you were, you failed out of school. You failed your next test. So yeah. you didn't walk on our it. High I always school. walked on it. I always walked on the seal. Oh, of course. Yeah, I did. Our high school <laughs> had one, and I can't for the life of me remember what the actual like warning was, mm-hmm. but I know that you didn't walk on this like certain part of the middle of the quad, and who cares? I walked on it all the time. Right. Sorry. Um, but this one actually has a cute story. According to legend, two students from the school fell in love, but the young man's parents disapproved because of the girl's lower social standing. That winter, the pair decided to elope. Their meeting place would be the seal. Unfortunately, on the night in question, the boy was delayed due to car trouble and his girlfriend froze to death while waiting for him. He died soon after of the proverbial broken heart. Legend has it that if a loving couple goes to the seal at midnight, the spirits of the long-deceased pair will materialize to show them their support. It's like really sad, but really cute. It's, yeah. It sounds like a creepy pasta story or something. It does. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah. Creepy pasta before creepy pasta existed. Yep. That is Central's stories. So I looked up student death at Central Michigan University. I'm just kind of going through the decades. Um, wow. What's up, CMU? Why you got so many deaths? Holy cow. Were they on campus or were they alumni? Because I looked up states and it was giving me like alumni that died in their 80s. Oh, no. This is definitely um, like students at the time. That, that poor, it's very sobering. That poor boy when that fell do down the stairs. Research. There's um, uh, somebody died in an apartment off campus. Uh, the Central Michigan University student who shot his parents. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, It was a manhunt. Uh Uh-huh. I was following that while it was happening. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... What up, CMU? We just find all the worst stuff about certain places. (laughs) Looking for fun ghosts, you know. Unfortunately, Because that's, you know, not also sad. Okay. Next, we have Michigan State University, which is apparently crawling with apparitions. My note is freaking ghosts all over the place. It really is. I can see it right in front of me. It's actually what it says. Yep. MSU has an active student paranormal society that you can follow online at MSU Paranormal. Most of these stories we learned of through them, though there is plenty of info online and in books like the two we mentioned earlier, and we'll be linking to on our site. Every October, MSU Paranormal hosts a haunted campus walking tour, which is totally worth it. We did it this year because, of course we did, and it was a fantastic evening. Yep, we went. I went last year with my husband too. It was really fun. It's in conjunction with the archaeological um, society? society. Yeah, and it was really cool to see to have both sides of a story. Which, yeah, in definitely. which case, it was usually one side each of a story <laughs> of yeah. different stories. Yeah, because they hardly matched. MSU was founded on February twelfth, eighteen fifty-five, as the Agricultural College of the State of Michigan one of the country's first institutions to teach scientific agriculture. Classes did not start until May 13, 1857. It went co-ed in 1870 and underwent several tweaks to its name until becoming known as Michigan State University, or MSU, in 1964. One of the most famous ghosts is in the Wharton Center and is known as Bill. We cannot find any historical records of anyone named Bill, and MSU officials say that there are no official reports of ghosts or otherworldly activity, But that doesn't stop students from sharing stories. Bill was supposedly killed in a violent beating in the 1980s. Objects are said to move from place to place. Doors open and close by themselves. Noises are heard at night. Lights turn on and off when no one is in the room. A student usher in 1989 named David Lower claims to have seen a full manifestation of Bill sitting in a director's chair in the performer's dressing room. He was wearing a white button-down shirt and black chinos. Uh, This story is courtesy of two books, Creepy Colleges and Haunted Universities, True Ghost Stories by Cynthia Fuma and Catherine Lower, and Haunted Colleges and Universities by Tom Ogden. I do want to point out, maybe someone else heard it, David Lower, Catherine Lower. Right? I I noticed that. I wonder if he told her personally and and 
their book is where this stems. Oh, yeah. Because you do see it everywhere. It's yeah. probably the most famous haunting. Mm-hmm. At least when I did research, it was the most famous haunting. Um, hmm. So as Kay said earlier, we couldn't find anything on Bill, but I did uncover a tragic murder on campus in the 1980s, as often happens when I research these things. I found an article in the Michigan Daily Newspaper, which is the University of Michigan's campus paper, not MSU's, for September 11th, 1986. MSU student Daricel Henry of Detroit pleaded innocent of the fatal stabbing of fellow student Sandra Clark. I couldn't find any follow-up articles, but I believe Henry was probably convicted, as I found a man of that name who seems to be about the right age on an inmate list for the Michigan Department of Corrections in Lansing, Michigan. So no ghost story, but definitely a tragedy. Absolutely a tragedy. Yeah. Haunted colleges and universities also tells us of a little boy who has been seen walking through the rows and seats of the Fairchild Theater. It goes, he also wanders the hallways and sometimes his face looks out of the third floor windows. Visitors reported hearing the sound of his laughter as well as whispering footsteps and a bouncing ball. Often the noises come from the empty wings of the stage. We did go looking at this building, too, while we were there at we third did. floor windows. We did not see anyone looking at us, I took a bunch of pictures. Keep looking. Maybe it's in there. Who knows? I haven't had a chance to go through them yet, so yeah. maybe <laughs> we'll have caught a ghost. If we find anything, we'll definitely be putting that on the website. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also the story of an old man who supposedly died in 1975 in Mason Hall and has been seen there since. There are also more banging noises, erratic lights, toilets that flush themselves, and an uneasy presence in the laundry room. I like the toilet that flushes itself. It's like yeah. it's- are they sure it's just not a self-flushing toilet? <laughs> <laughs> mm, I don't know. <laughs> it's just annoyed. Uh, several sources talk about Beaumont Tower, which is where our haunted campus tour began. According to On the Banks of the Red Cedar, an MSU site with lots of info about the university's history, Uh, A ghost of a student killed during World War II is said to haunt the tower. He allegedly stays on in the earthly world searching for his lost sweetheart he left behind. The bells have frequently been seen and heard ringing by themselves. So again, a lot, lots of dorm, dorm hauntings, dorm stories. So many. So many. Freaking crawling with ghosts. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The one that we stopped at both years, it was, I believe, the only dorm we stopped at this year, was Mary Mayo Hall. And that's the first entry, actually, that Ogden has in his book. And it's the most significant. It's the longest. Um, it was, the hall was built in 1931 in the school's oldest residence hall. The dormitory was originally called Sylvan Lodge because it was located in a small park. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, the building was renamed for Mary Ann Mayo, who was on the governing committee of the Michigan Agricultural College and an advocate for women's studies. Stories began to circulate almost immediately after Mayo Hall opened that the place harbored an apparition. The female figure, never positively identified but thought to be Mayo, strolls through the corridors, flips lights on and off, messes with electrical appliances, and is responsible for strange noises and the piano playing itself at night. Folks have felt cold gusts of wind and invisible fingers touching them. Furniture rearranges itself. The paranormal phenomena seem to be particularly active in the West Lounge, a basement hallway, and the corridor linking the two wings of the building. An oil portrait of Mayo hangs on the first floor, and her eyes seem to follow people as they move around the room. Ooh. <laughs> Spooky. Um, I guess there was a thought that she or someone had committed suicide, but that seems to be not true. Mm. I do remember that last year they talked about supposedly a student killed herself in the attic and they did not mention that this year. So, and this is saying that that's not true. Hmm. I wonder if they decided to take that off because yeah, it's obviously not true. Yeah. I wonder if the archaeological society was like, hey, tone it down. Yeah, perhaps. Because <laughs> they were not too thrilled about having to share the paranormal half of some of those stories. Yeah, they were not. <laughs> They were clearly not thrilled. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, was the Mary Mayo one the one of, you know, there was a building that burned down that they built on top of. Was that that one? No. Okay. I, I don't have so. the map with me because I know where we, it was our first stop. Oh, uh, that was the lab. Okay. That's the lab. Yep. That had burned down. And yeah. And they built on top of it. But no one died in that fire. Nope. Which yeah, a good. lot of fires. Not too many people actually died in the fires, which yeah. is pretty good. Pretty lucky. 
Uh, nearby to Mary Mayo Hall is Yakely Gilchrist Hall, constructed in 1948. That one, actually, this one's somewhat recent. The hall's ghost story began in the summer of 1995 when a panicked female student called security around midnight to report someone banging on her door. When the police arrived, they could hear the pounding and see the door shaking, but no one was standing there. The incident lasted only a few minutes, but the tale has been repeated so often that there are now frequent claims about turning doorknobs and thumping at the doors. Which I know people used to just do that. I know. It was so annoying. Yeah. They would just be walking down the halls and they just like rattle your door handle and like bang on it and then just keep walking. Yeah. So it's because college students are jerks. Sorry, yeah. guys. Yeah. You are. 100%. Um, Williams Hall, dating from 1937. Um, that one was destroyed by fire. Eerie sounds escape empty rooms and electrical devices such as appliances and the TV in the lobby flip themselves on and off. Also, dark, unidentifiable figures have been caught dancing in a room that used to be a cafeteria. That's really nice. Yeah, it's kind of cute. <laughs> I like that one. Um, uh, Holmes Hall is another one that has phenomena. Um, Hubbard Hall. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Saints Rest, which was the original dorm at MSU that unfortunately burned down. There are said to be apparitions of the original students that lived in the dorm. Uh, no one died in that fire, thankfully. Yeah, they were all home for the holidays. Mm-hmm. But the students are said to appear in the early mornings um, and in the evening searching for their last hall and personal belongings. This is from um, on the banks of the Cedar. And uh, archaeologists have done a lot of work there as well. <laughs> That's one of the places that student archaeologists have uh, dug up and found a lot of cool stuff, including, you know, the dorm's trash pile and the bathroom. <laughs> yep. That's where they found the head, the doll's head. The doll's head. Yeah. Which is supposedly evil. A psychic that took the tour last year, something told them it was possessed or whatever. And Yeah. Sure, why not? <laughs> and the archaeological. They had, it, yeah. they had it on display. Yeah. Look that was cool. It. Took pictures of it. but yeah. And the archaeological society was like, yeah, possessed. Okay. Sure. Uh-huh. A uh, creepy name for a dorm, though. Saints Rest. Yeah, and Ogden actually does say why it's called that. The building never had a name. He says after it burned down in 1876, it acquired the nostalgic sobriquet Saints Rest from a 1650 Puritan devotional written by Richard Baxter entitled The Saints Everlasting Rest. Which would make sense if it was a cemetery and people had died there, but... <laughs> and we did confirm there are cemeteries named Saints Rest. Yeah, I looked them up. There's yeah. like one in Texas and one in Maryland, but... Um, now it's just kind of a small, expansive ground with a memorial plaque next to it. Yeah. And it's just by the road in between some buildings and, you know, it'd be a nice place to have a little, a little rest in between classes, but. Yeah. I think they had done an EVP session there as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I need to hear those. I know. We didn't get to hear any of them. I need them. Um, the W.J. Beale Botanic Garden. Yeah. That was, that was on the tour last year. That was not on the tour this year. They did the lab this year uh, instead, I believe. Oh, I wish they'd done the garden, though. Yeah. And they had EVP from that as well, which, again, we haven't heard any of these. It's just their word saying that they had EVP. Yeah. So of the There's apparently screams, and you can occasionally see. Was it a shadow person or an apparition? Yeah. Dark, ghostly figures strolling the grounds is what Ogden says. I'll take it. Mm-hmm. That sounds great. I want to. <laughs> I want to experience that. Um, you know the screams. It's a college campus, so anything that's auditory, I kind of give a little grain of salt to. Yeah. Having lived on a college campus, they are loud all of the time. Yeah, and it's you're right on like you're in the middle of campus. You're not off somewhere. You're in the middle of campus, and campus is also surrounded by like a very walkable yeah. shop filled area. Yeah. Um, the lab, which we mentioned, it was Beale's lab, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, that, yeah, that burned down and that was near the gardens. And that supposedly they also have similar phenomena there as well. Yeah. Um, and then there are the, as I mentioned earlier, the steam tunnels that were built under campus uh, to house campus utilities. A lot of uh, old universities and you old hospitals and things like that have built have tunnels underneath their buildings because it gets freaking cold here yeah <laughs> and very snowy especially the more north you go and they didn't have the the technology to deal with it as we do today yeah so there is a legend surrounding that that is probably not true but it's a 
interesting legend. Um, it, it says that in August 1979, James Dallas Egbert III, an MSU student and a parent child prodigy, disappeared from his dorm. He liked to go to the steam tunnels to LARP, that is live action role play Dungeons and Dragons. The legend portion is that he was so upset by the death of his D&D character that he tried to commit suicide. The real story, because this is a real person, um, is that he suffered from depression, which led to him trying to commit suicide with Quaaludes because it was the 70s. If you don't know what those are, look those up. They're very 70s. Following his failed attempt, he went to Louisiana and tried again, and this time was unfortunately successful. But they're not haunted. No, I don't. I don't think no. they are. That is a popular campus story. Yes, um, but nobody committed suicide there that anyone can find. Yeah, he certainly didn't do it. Doesn't seem to have done it there. No. So, um, but it's a sad story. It's a sad story, and it's also this is also getting into the height of satanic panic when Dungeons and Dragons was seen as of the devil and magic and worshiping Satan. And all that fun stuff, so it doesn't surprise me that the the legend was started that Egbert um, tried to commit suicide because of this game. Right. Um, and so the truth is that he suffered from depression. Yeah. Which, Which it's its own kind of haunting. Mm-hmm, that's true. Um, and then there's the rape trail, and I'm not going to give any any no. time to that. No, I mean, it Western not haunted. had one or two rape trails that's what we called them but mm-hmm. did things happen there maybe but mm. no we're just yeah i'm, I'm gonna didn't... pass right over that <laughs> yeah i didn't really give any credence to that one because no. it's i feel like every campus has its rape trail mm-hmm. it all has stories um should we move on to u of m sure we can move on to u of m <laughs> <laughs> If you're wondering why we're laughing, it's because U of M is not haunted. Nope. Nope. <laughs> I found one story and one story only. <laughs> it's I'm I'm gonna read what Ogden says in his book because he covers it very well. Mm-hmm. He does. <laughs> so it was the story comes from a TV show, a sci fi channel TV show called School Spirits, and it was the first episode on June twentieth, two thousand twelve. It was called Sorority House Terror. (laughs) So slightly sensationalized. (laughs) Slightly. Yeah. Um, Ogden says, otherwise the tale seems to be undocumented. And that is true. The only two places I found it was when I found that episode online and in his book. And I was really glad, actually, that he mentioned it in his book. So he says, the name used for the sorority on TV, Gamma Alpha Gamma, was a pseudonym. It's believed the story refers to Phi Rho Alpha, but none of the footage was shot in their sorority house. According to the TV show, three new sisters who moved into the house in 2009 experienced strange things, such as disembodied footsteps on the stairs, maggots in their food, an infestation of bats, and other phenomena, including the appearance of a ghost. One of the girls recognized the phantom from a photo in an old book as Joseph Walser, a UM graduate who lived in the house with his family in the 1890s. The end. (laughs) The end. (laughs) It sounds more to me like they just lived in a terrible house. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's Michigan. You get bats. Bats in the attic, bats in a house. Not uncommon. No. Not at all. It happened twice to my parents. Yeah. A friend of mine just told me a story about a bat in her apartment. It, it, we just bats had a, happen. Yeah. We just had a bat in our apartment. Um, and then a month before that, we had we get bats at the museum all the time. Um, big double doors. Yeah, that's nice, nice just, warm space. They're very cute. Yeah, um, so that doesn't ring any bells for me. I'm like, okay, you had bats. You lived in a house and you were in Michigan. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and you lived in like probably a not well kept up college house. Yeah, and it's at least a hundred years old. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's gonna let some bats in. Yeah. Um, the maggot thing is weird. But this is a gross story. Um, In our first house back in California, after we had gotten, our house had been tented and we'd gotten rid of the roaches, I woke up one morning to find a large number of maggots covering my kitchen floor. That is disgusting. (laughs) Because they had all fallen from the ceiling after the tenting. God. 
um, and I had to sweep them all up, and we had to get rid of some of Ivy's toys, and I felt really bad. Oh. Um, it was not a ghost. <laughs> a ghost could not have fit in that house. It was 450 square feet. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying it's not something paranormal, but I'm gonna say it's probably not something paranormal. It's something you hear more often with like demons, yeah, um, possession stories, uh huh, that kind of thing. You don't usually hear it with ghosts, and we haven't seen this episode. We don't know what kind of other things were happening, but yeah, given the nature of the TV show, I'm thinking it's probably sensationalized. Oh, I'm sure. Man, imagine walking in there, though, and telling them they had a demon instead. Yeah. <laughs> you were wrong about that. Um, <laughs> wrong terms. That ghost that you had? No, my friend. Yeah. Sit down. You might want to listen to this. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the one story. That's it. I could find for U of M. Um, which is not to say that we won't be covering U of M in some aspects. It has a long and sometimes dark history. Uh, yeah. just as of this recording, we cannot find any easily accessible ghost stories. Um, there are, however, some easily accessible, uh, medical building stories and serial killer stories. Yes. And I really love those kinds of stories. So I'm sure at one point I will commandeer this podcast and we will talk a little bit about serial killers in Michigan. That may be an Ann Arbor part two. <laughs> it very well might be if you go to U of M if you went to U of M if you experienced anything weird we would love to hear from you uh, for some reason there's just not stories from that campus like there are from almost all of the other ones except for Western yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, so email us at contact haunted, contact haunted mitten at gmail.com we want to hear from you absolutely it's our oldest university and there are Zero stories. How is this not haunted? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. It's crazy. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Our social media is uh, Haunted Mitten across the board. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I personally am trying to get a lot better at posting to our social media. I kind of forget it exists because I don't really use my own. Um, yep. I've been trying to get on top of it and... I, I found so much in the month of October that was really easy to share. Yeah. Um, but I will definitely be finding interesting things about Michigan, haunted articles, haunted locations. People yeah. People can check out. If there's an event coming up, I'll post that. It'll and... be harder as we leave Spooktober, but we'll do yeah. it. <laughs> My personal social media is K Gray Writes pretty much across the board. Um, like I said, I tend to ignore it, especially Twitter and Facebook. So if you really want to find me, check out Instagram for pictures of my awesome animals and pictures of the nature trail I live next to. Other than that, I'm super boring and I'm not even working on anything except Nano. So I don't even have any extras to offer you this month. I am Krista K. Coburn on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I'm far more active uh, than K is for sure. <laughs> and I'll so be- I'm just nodding like you can see me, but <laughs> so much more active. Um, because I do run a few um, social media stuff for businesses and things around town, as well as my own, as well as Haunted Mitten. So, which I appreciate so much. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, if you contact Haunted Mitten or if you contact me, I will definitely get back to you. It may take me some time, but usually I, I mean, it tells me as soon as someone messages me, it's right on my phone. So <laughs> <laughs> if that's true. So I, I usually get back to people. I try to get back to people pretty quickly. All right. We'll promote things when we have things to promote, but thank you for listening. Next week, look forward to another ghost story of a different color. Ooh! Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Happy haunting.